Good afternoon, everyone. This is Tulio Siragusa with Dojo Live. Today, I am joined by my co-host, Carlos Ponce, who is just outside of Mexico City, and right. Kim Lantis in Hermosillo, Mexico. Hello. And we have our guest today. We have uh, two co-founders guests today, uh, Shannon Bex, who's the Chief Communication Officer, and Russell Herzl, who is the CTO of Book. Not the COO, right? CO, pardon me, yeah. <laughs> of books. <laughs> One, it doesn't uh, matter. One of those C's. <laughs> it's the guys making things happen. Um, and we're going to be talking yeah. about storybooks brought to life today. But before we go into into that, let's uh, let the guests introduce themselves. I'd like to first tell us a little bit about yourself. Chandler, Sorry, what's that? Oh, okay. I, I don't know. It cut out for I'm a second. <laughs> Why don't you tell, tell the audience who you are? Tell us a little about you. <laughs> I'm Shannon, and actually, um, our other co founder is my brother, Marshall Bax. He's the CEO. Um, he couldn't join us today, but my background personally comes from the music industry. I was a multi platinum touring and recording artist for more years than I'd like to say. <laughs> but um, all my knowledge with the streaming and licensing rights um, has helped me with my acquisitions and my conversations with publishers and getting the content and the books for our platform. <laughs> to you, Russell. <laughs> yeah, and uh, so I'm Russell Herzl. Uh, I, as uh, Tulio mentioned, I am the, uh, Chief Operating Officer, officer, and I also am a co-founder, and I also head up uh, production for books. So all of the animated storybooks that you see when you go on to books.com, uh, I've been the one that's kind of uh, spearheading uh, that operation from a high level. Um, my background is in character animation originally. So I went to art school initially and got my degree in animation. Uh, that's actually where I met my wife, who was also getting her degree in animation. And she now even works as our uh, kind of executive producer over production. So that's really fun. It kind of has always been our dream to make animations together. Actually, the first animation we ever worked on uh, together was a project in school that our, <laughs> our teachers told us we shouldn't <laughs> work on because we were dating. But here we are, all these years later, we showed them. You got it. You guys uh, are great. <laughs> all right. Fantastic. <laughs> well, we're, we're joined also by an incredibly talented animator and illustrator, Carlos. Because, I don't know if you guys knew about that, but Carlos is a very extremely talented animator and illustrator. I didn't know That's that. A whole lot of, yes, I, yes. Um, yeah, yeah, the one time we had That's the stupid idea. That's a whole lot of conversation for yeah, another well, day. But, we had the stupid but, idea of challenging him to Pictionary and... We got it. No, he's really good. He's really You're good. Long. He's not so working even for blogs and stuff. But but let's get back to books. What gave birth to books? Tell us what it's about, who your targeted audience is. Tell us about the yeah. company. Yeah, well, the books is storybooks brought to life. We take the existing books that you'll see, classics like Giraffes Can't Dance or Where the Wild Things Are or brand new stories from authors, and we recreate them in a linear ver uh, version page for page, line for line, but we add slight animation and purposeful pacing so that kids can follow along in a read aloud. And just um, it helps retention studies have shown that the combination of the read aloud while the texts are being highlighted um, helps kids retain, um, retain information and enhances their literacy, imagination, and focus, so. Yeah, one of, the, awesome. one of the cool things that kind of started it all was uh, Shannon mentioned her brother Marshall who's also our CEO and our fellow co-founder. Um, what Marshall and I had worked together for years um, back in our days we worked out at Nike and um, there was a time where ebooks were starting to come out and digital ebooks and interactive ones where kids could push on things and make make things happen. Um, and Marshall was realizing that his kids would kind of lose interest in the story and they wanted to just turn it into a game. And that kind of started the conversation of us talking about, is there a way to combine videos and books to where you get the best of the video format, but you still get to retain everything about it that's a book? And that was kind of the, the genesis for it all. Great. Well, I'm looking forward personally to learn a lot more because uh, I have a young one and she's totally hooked on Roblox. And I'm trying to find other ways for her to use interactive uh, computing with learning. 
and we tried ABC Mouse. That's not cutting it for her. So let's see what we can learn today. Carlos, what's the topic of our uh, show today? Let's get right into it. Absolutely, Tulio. Thank you so much. Well, today we're going to be speaking about uh, the challenges of quality screen time. And uh, our guests are going to be answering the question, does streaming storybooks crack the code? So that's what we're going to be talking about. They're going to be um, touching on, on, on the challenges of quality screen time and, and what it's all about. So the first question that I have for our guests, both Shannon and Russell, why did you choose this particular topic for today's conversation? Why, why do you think it's relevant nowadays? Well, I think I'll start first. I think that okay. uh, screen Please. time, well, no matter what it is, is a challenge. I think, and I'm I personally am not a parent, but Cam, you can totally speak to this. That there's that that almost guilt feeling of giving a child screen time, and there's also that question of should I even give my child screen time? But then, uh, you know, the more we we talk with parents, we realize they also need that little break or that moment or that breath to go grab the laundry or go, <laughs> go take the shower um, right. and and quality screen time is a very hard thing to find if especially the age demographic we're looking for we're, we're two to eight years of age is our focus and you don't want to throw them on YouTube a kids YouTube and you don't want to just stick them in front of another just cartoon where they're just gonna get that zombie effect and and um, you want to have them engaging with something um, but sometimes apps are hard learning apps are hard because the parent might need to be there with them to help show them how to do it as well so the, the, the concept of the, us doing a read aloud video version of a book is you can give your child an average books, which is seven and a half minutes, and know they're actually being read a book and retaining and um, encouraging literacy. So that's where we kind of decided to dive into that conversation. Today. Yeah, I think as a parent, I think you're right, especially I, I'll be honest, this is something that I've had struggled with um, throughout being a mother, you know, probably relying more on the television and, <laughs> and internet than I probably should as a working mom. But even more so right now, as yeah. everybody's stuck at home 24 hours a day, seven days a week, schools are closed. You're trying to put on all these different hats simultaneously. And I get to the point where I'm like, you know what? Whatever. Like, do what you want. I have to focus on this. Yeah. And you're right. There is this guilt element. Um, and for me and my husband, one of our biggest concerns is safety, right? Um, you mentioned YouTube, and I think YouTube is a great tool, and there's awesome things. Tulio yeah. mentioned Roblox earlier. And whether we like it or not, there are bad people who exactly. publish bad things on the internet and that's always a concern for us like my daughter yeah. for roblox she's eight and i we have the strict rule you are not allowed to friend anyone if you have a friend who's on roblox we need to communicate with that friend via another medium mm -hmm. identify exactly their user and then you can search for them and you can friend that person but you're not allowed to friend any stranger and so we have to lay out all these rules and this is constant thing and we're even like hey you can't be on that device in your bedroom you have to be in the living room you have to be where i can hear you you have to be and so what does this is something that i'm hearing that really sets the books apart i could have yeah. my daughter in her room using books and not have to no nope. pay exactly. attention right. no quality it's going to be age appropriate we don't have advertisements there's nothing but books that's it you know exactly simply books is what they're getting i love that i was curious about this idea of content how you guys go about choosing the books that you're going to include um and i think i'm going to go on a limb here i'm i already went through your library a little bit i'm actually going to purchase and download today i'm really thrilled about this especially <laughs> since you. summer's coming up and i'm not gonna have a teacher sending me lesson plans for the next two months you know um but content how do you choose content that's going to speak to all walks of life and all children on your platform i remember just a couple weeks ago, I was actually reading, I think, something on Facebook where a guy who works in a comic book store actually got to introduce uh, a little black boy to Miles, right? The black Spider-Man and how he was like, hey, he's like me. And so uh, is that something that you're intentional about? Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I, I mean, our, our heart really is that we want books to be something that can spread joy to children all over the world. And to do that, we need to have stories that children can look at and see 
you know, what they see around them represented in those stories. That's something that is hugely important to us because we believe that everybody is important. Everybody is unique and wonderful. And that's kind of just our, our biggest mission is to impact people in a positive way and to spread joy like that. Um, and on the, on the actual acquiring side, we're in luck today because Shannon actually heads up acquisitions for us as well. <laughs> you want to talk about that, Shannon? Oh, sure. Yeah. But so, I mean, of course we love marquee titles because people recognize that they're trusted, but you know, reviews are very important for us. We might see a beautiful illustrated storybook that has great content, but then when you really dig into what the reviews say, sometimes maybe it's been offensive to a group of people or, or the subject just kind of lays flat. So we definitely do take some care and consideration into what books we do find. Um, but there's so many wonderful stories out there and they don't all have to be marquee, but we definitely try to find find diverse, um, you know, book lists or recommendations from teachers or even parents. Uh, we take it from all aspects, from our Facebook groups to our newsletters that go out and then they respond. All aspects we um, do consider recommendations from our audience because we they know what they want to see. Um, and we're, we're constantly reaching out to publishers and finding uh, different books that we can go after. And then the challenging part comes with rights and availabil availability of those rights and if we can even license them. So, Sometimes you don't you do hit a wall, but for the most part, we really try to cast a wide net. How do you go about curating the content based on the user? Right, uh, as Kim has alluded, there's different desires, different cultures. Yeah. How do you go about curating that? Is that something that's done through user focus groups, or you use AI? What's what are you guys doing with that? Yeah, so currently, because we're a startup, you know, uh, all that is kind of still in development. We've got a lot of stuff in the works for coming features that's going to be involved around that. Um, things in terms of, uh, you know, learning and recommendations for what the kids will like, what, what they're watching um, based on some, you know, different uh, indicators. And then also the idea of parents having the ability to choose the content that um, their kids maybe can see or can't see. We think that that is really important that parents are able to have that control, especially because, you know, we want this to be a safe place for kids. Um, and nobody knows the kids better than their parents. Um, but right now, uh, yeah, we're, we're pretty much still in the MVP phase. Um, we're actually about to launch some new stuff pretty soon that is very exciting. Um, but a lot of that right now is just done through um, kind of old fashioned learning, through talking to people, um, doing uh, some surveys we've done, uh, different stuff like that. Yeah. That's really nice. I'm curious about, um, I, um, your approach to your libraries is this like a your business model i guess is it like a monthly subscription and you get full access or do you have to like purchase your books to have access to them what's that model and why did you choose it yeah, yeah. so we are a subscription based model we're monthly or yearly but per month is 4.99 access to our entire library or you could purchase a year at 49.99 and it gives you basically 2 months free again access to the entire year I oh, love that's that. a pretty good deal. And I'm so excited about this commercial. <laughs> I'm not even kidding you. As soon as we're done, I'm going to be like, oh, looks. Because, right, so, uh, so just, just for comparison purposes, right? Um, um, as an adult, I've used things like Audible. I've used services, uh, uh, Blinks, which I love, which is like the summary of books uh, for really busy professionals. I've yeah. gone through 10 books in a two-hour drive, for example, that kind right. of thing. Um, and so I love that capability. And there was another service that actually features authors that are not necessarily mainstream. So mm -hmm. is your intention to, to open up the platform to, cause right now you're, you're basically a publisher, right? But you don't create your own content as of right now, but is it to eventually create a model where it also creates opportunities for up and coming children Absolutely. book authors who can get exposure Absolutely. to this kind of medium? Uh, tell us a little we, bit about that. 
Yeah, we do see an opportunity where we can bring unknown or unpublished authors and illustrators an opportunity to have a platform and get in front of millions of kids around the world. And we're, our hopes for that is they could even take those views to a publisher and be like, hey, this is we already have an audience. We're getting a cult following. This is popular. It's another marketing platform for authors and illustrators um, to display their work. So we already have a, a good amount of independent um, creators submitting stuff to our, our library or, or to, to be reviewed for our library. Um, so yeah, it's definitely on the roadmap uh, to expand that even more. Yeah, and a great example of that even is one of our great publishing partners, Familius. Um, they're not necessarily a household name uh, in the publishing industry, although they have a really quality reputation in the industry of having incredible books, um, incredible quality. And it's been fun that uh, one of their books in particular called Unicorn and Horse, and Kim, I would highly recommend <clears throat> for your kids, check out Unicorn and Horse. Um, it, I mean, it largely outperforms even the, the marquee titles that are those household names. Um, so that's really fun to see that we can, we can bring these books that are amazing books, but, you know, maybe just they haven't hit the lottery, you know, to be that household name and right. kind of help them become a household name. Um, I got a question myself. Uh, this is uh, be because we're talking about books, right? Albeit uh, digital books and streaming and all that, but there's still books, as Shannon mentioned. It's just, you know, that's what you have. It's actual books and access through a digital platform. So my question is, because of the fact that there, we're, we're, it's, we're talking about a cultural component here, we're mm -hmm. talking about language, we're talking about even visuals, but especially language. Mm -hmm. How do you see books uh, like reaching out to maybe other countries, other languages, other geographies, mm -hmm. and what sort of challenges are involved in the process? And how do you plan if, do you, are, is there any kind of growth in that sense? Yeah. And how are you gonna go about it? Yeah, um, you know, right now we are global and our main, our main focus is the English language with anticipation of building our roadmap to other um, languages. Uh, the, the thing we found really encouraging is uh, it's, it's being so well received in in many countries. Um, so when you know the publishing industry, you realize a lot of times uh, when when the physical print books are licensed, they're only given print rights per country or per region, and some countries are not able to even access certain mm. books. But because we're digital, uh, we can be a digital library where books can be now accessed where they never could have before. And we've gotten some amazing response of um, books helping with a second language, English being a second language for their, their students or for their kids. Um, and it's just been received so well. So right now we're, we're still on that path, but we're completely um, open and will be diving into other languages um, in the future. Along Perfect. those lines, you, I'm, I'm curious. Along the future, I'm also curious to learn with with the um, you know a lot of the uh, educate from home scenarios that we've been under for the past few months. Uh, is there plans to partner with uh, academia, uh, you know, uh, school systems to potentially deliver even learning books? Uh, and what would be unique about what you guys are doing that's different than just the child having access to the words on the screen? What, what, what's the compelling component that increases learning or increases retention of information or at least increases the attention span? Because we, we know how difficult it is to get these kids to pay attention to anything long term right now. So tell us a little bit about that. Are there any plans for that? How do you, how do you plan to do that? Yeah, there's a few different things that go into that. On the, um, on the side of potentially teaming up with academia or whatnot, um, that's kind of another thing where we we have some stuff in the works that we're we're trying for. One thing that we've we've kind of tried to walk this fine line of um, being whichever way you want to turn it, the the most educational entertainment app or the most entertaining educational app. And where we've kind of landed is that we want we want to be seen as entertainment for the kids because when kids see something as homework, you know, it becomes less exciting to them. Um, but there's a, a saying that Marshall, our, uh, our CEO likes to say about chocolate covered broccoli, 
that there's this <laughs> this idea that what we do with books is that we give kids what they want, which is this this fun, engaging animation. Um, but parents then know that the kids are also getting the educational aspect to it. So it's kind of the best of both worlds. And I think the the engagement comes from um, the fact that we're starting from a basis that already kind of puts us ahead. And that is the book, the actual book. You have these, these pieces of art, essentially, that people have spent months pouring over each image, um, every word that's in the book. And that's our foundation that we're building on top of. So there's not, there's not a lot we have to do to make it more engaging. We add the, you know, we add the animation, we keep it limited, as Shannon said, purposeful. Um, we have music and sound design and all that together with that strong base, um, I think is what engages the kids so much. And then the kids don't even realize, you know, at that point that uh, they're actually being encouraged to read along as they see the text animating across the screen and they hear it, they're getting word association, they're, they're learning sight words without even realizing it. And beyond that, they're getting excited about books that they might not have been excited about before. We've had stories of kids who don't like reading just because it's something they struggle with, but then they watch um, a book on books and they realize, oh, there's an actual book of this as well. And then they get excited to go read the book. <laughs> yeah. Right. Lab fun. I don't know how well uh, chocolate covered broccoli would work in my house, but I have. Um, <laughs> I love blended. that though. Choc we're the chocolate know, covered broccoli of reading. I love it. I know. But what I do do is blend the vegetables with the minced meat and then cook it. Smart. Okay. And then you can nice. put it in the yeah. yeah. Um, but going back to this real idea, this idea, um, is there any elements, first of all, I guess for older kids, can you turn the sound off and things so that they can actually do the reading on their own? Like what elements, you mentioned the age groups two to eight. Um, mm -hmm. So what are the variations for those different levels? And also, are there in, have you incorporated like gamification, like badges or, you know, like tiers and things for them to like keep going and everybody's you know, children are so competitive. I was just wondering yeah, sure. if you've incorporated that as well. <laughs> you know, at this point, we, we, we're steering away from any gamification um, just to keep it as simple and clean and beautiful as possible and not, you know, the parents don't have to learn how the kids can win things for them. The, kid, the parent can literally sign in and pass it over. Uh, so at this point, we're, we're steering clear of gamification. Uh, but, you know, I do agree. Kids like to feel rewarded for things or have accomplishments, um, you know, and, and that's something on our roadmap too. Like right now, a small level of accomplishment is where we partner with Save the Children for their 100 days of reading so that kids can incorporate their books time with uh, that 100 days of reading challenge. So we definitely know kids love a challenge. And we have a read 10 books and read 10 or watch 10 books. So we kind of are trying to challenge kids to, especially for summertime um, with earning and reading and, and, and it's celebrating, but nothing is technically done yet on the site for that. And then uh, I might blanked on your other question. Of age on, groups, uh, age groups, oh, how levels? Eight. So we don't, we curated our channel really specifically to more of social emotional development or be kind, be brave, have grit, uh, or biography channel, more subject based versus two to four, four to five, you know, um, age categories. And we know that kids skew from two to eight dramatically in the reading. <coughs> but there are some eight year olds that aren't confident yet and and this is helping just to reiterate things that they need with their literacy um and also it's you know we read aloud to two and three and four year olds um sometimes we're reading books that are above their level so they can start retaining larger words and understanding a broader vocabulary as well so um i will say our sweet spot is three to six um but we still try and focus not too young of um like picture books board books but we try to skew a little younger but we definitely want to keep it pretty broad i like it and you know going back to rewards isn't learning just the reward in itself uh <laughs> and right. speaking of Wonderful. right i mean that is the reward exactly. and my, my eight-year-old's like <laughs> Uh. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. so, but, but I have a question along those lines. I have, the, I have a question. I don't know if it's too soon or if you're planning to do a study or you're already tracking this. Are, are they sort of improvement in communication skills of children that are more engaged in this kind of medium versus 
those who might struggle with just a book and you know getting through the lines what has yeah. have you seen anything along those lines what 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 uh, kind of data do you have around that I don't want to take Russell's light. Russell, if you want to go for this, but I have a quick, I have an answer a little bit. Um, so I'll start. Yeah, go, <laughs> go ahead. I'll, I'll pick you up. I'm, I'm the youngest. I'm the youngest child between Marshall and myself. So I'm the talker. <laughs> well, but, I, you know, I think this is such a new concept, uh, really, that we have yet to get that type of data, which we are launching some of our own independent studies to help support this. There is other research that's been done with that shows read aloud read aloud with a parent read aloud with an ai um the physical book so it's definitely conversations that are happening and we we intend to keep digging and finding what that research is um, but there's also research that does support is the simplicity of the um highlighted text as it's being read the dyslexic right. community we've worked with and they have specifically mm -hmm. agreed that this type of format helps retain um and helps the dyslexic community but Russell, take it away yeah it it's mm -hmm. been um like shannon said uh we're we're working on those actual studies you know empirical kind of studies um but in terms of what we've heard just anecdotally from people we've we've gotten a ton of feedback from people along those lines a funny instance was a a girl who loved the book chrysanthemum and her and her mom were at the library and she saw the book and she ran up and grabbed it and she's like look mom chrysanthemum and she's reading the word to her and it had become a sight word and she she couldn't even read yet and the mom was saying of all her the first words that she could sight read, it's chrysanthemum. Um, and we've got a lot of other kind of anecdotal things of people who say that, you know, it's encouraging their children to read more. They love that. Even uh, like Shannon mentioned, the dyslexic community, there's been really great feedback on that, which is fun and kind of warms the heart, especially um, even to the point of we've had multiple people who work with uh, autistic children or who have autistic children who really struggle to find ways to help them kind of be calm and centered um, and sit and watch something specifically. But with books, it's almost like a switch is being flipped where, you know, suddenly they engage like they don't with anything else. So there's, there's definitely something to the medium and those studies are kind of just starting around um, <clears throat> watching animated stories and seeing the read along text and hearing it aloud as well. Wow, I mean, uh, that's an interesting take on uh, folks on the spectrum. I have some family members, and they they're glued to their iPads, and and mm. uh, so this is a great. You just gave me a great idea. I'm going to be <laughs> calling some family members of like how to get their kids to 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 engage in some educational uh, stuff. But when you talk about chrysanthemum, you were talking about a child saw that on books, and then at the library connected to the actual physical book because they had a relationship that was established right. through this that's fantastic and she's even able to <laughs> <laughs> she's even able to read through some of the words through the story the mom was saying oh. um just because she's heard it so many times she's seen the words so now she makes that visual association yeah. with it well now you got two new clients out of this show right here <laughs> him and myself we're gonna be downloading this right after this so we're coming up on time we're coming up on time and um, unless you guys have an adi any additional questions, I want to shift a little bit to understanding what the journey has been like building this company. Kim, you have another question I before we do that? One question, I think. You mentioned this idea of rather than splitting books into this age group, you've kind of got it split into what I understood, sort of like a value systems or a theme based. Mm -hmm. Which of the values that you have highlighted on books would you say you as a company books Ooh. most? greatly isn't aligned with right oh, now boy, we just, like... launched, just launched one uh, in light of everything that's been going on we've had a lot of parents and teachers reach out to us requesting help in um, providing books that can help them with objective racism and unity and understanding so we just launched a free channel so you don't even have to have access of about six titles and we call it unity so that's definitely shows shows hearts our heart is again like russell said to spread joy spread love and um you know today's readers make tomorrow's leaders so great values i absolutely love that 
All right, so let's let's uh, wrap it up with one final question. What's this journey been like for you guys? What have you learned about yourself in building this business? Russell? <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> we're getting introspective. That's good. Um, <clears throat> I man, that's that's a really good question. Um, Still learning, I right? think <laughs> more than anything, um, it's been it's been really challenging to be completely honest. Um, which is, uh, you know, as you listen to any story of entrepreneurs, that's that's kind of the one thing that rings true across all of them is how hard it can be, but then at the same time, how rewarding it is. So I think kind of the the thing that I've learned is, and I I'm personally not a parent. My my wife and I don't have children, but it's been interesting to kind of make this analogy as we're going through this of we're you know we're having. And I'm not. I'm obviously not trying to compare this to actually having children. It's a completely different thing. Uh, but just the analogy of um, having late nights where you're up with your baby, you know, and <laughs> you're having to you're having to stay awake all hours taking care of it. That your your life becomes completely focused on it. <laughs> and um, so I think for me, kind of just seeing the the amount of effort that has to go into it. But then also the as hard as it gets, also seeing that incredible reward you get out of it. When if I see a video of a child watching um, something on books and laughing, it almost brings me to tears because it just is kind of that fulfillment of everything that you've been working for. So I think that's probably been the biggest thing for me. No offense taken. I get it. I always say to myself sometimes that parenting is not happiness, but it is meaningfulness. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I mean, I mean, it sounds like one of the things you've learned is you can be a parent without having children. You can, you know, you can have that spirit no matter what. So love yeah. that. What about you, Shannon? You know, good question. I think for me, just on the entrepreneurial side, the way my journey, my path is going, like in music, I never would have dreamt that an opportunity like this or transformation of my career like this could have happened. And I think a bit of advice for other um, people who might think, okay, this is my career, this is where I'm at, this is where I'm heading, this is where I'm going, and then life changes or something changes or a path to be, being open. And I'm so happy that I opened myself to, you know, this opportunity. Um, and I'm just so fulfilled by it. And the team, Russell, my brother, and everyone that surrounds us is incredible. And they work so hard. And um, to me, it's just been such a joy. This journey has been a joy. Yes, long nights, but it, <laughs> it makes it easy. Makes it well, easy. congratulations, Shannon. You're joining a group of very powerful women who have come from the entertainment space and recording artist space who have become entrepreneurs. Several several very strong women that we, we know very well. So congratulations. Uh, we, we wish you a lot of success with that. And yeah. we're wrapping that up. Uh, thanks for joining us today. And uh, for the audience watching on Monday, we're going to have our recap show. It's at 1 p.m. We're going to recap two shows. We're going to recap this show the key things we've learned here. So come back to uh, to take notes. It's 10 minutes. We do it all in 10 minutes. And we're going to recap yesterday's show as well. So we look forward to having you back. And Carlos, for next week, what do we have on tap? You're on mute. <laughs> I, I usually am on mute. You know me. I'm the mute guy. <laughs> <laughs> I am the mute guy. <laughs> One of the benefits of watching Dojo Live, guys, is that we have the feature of closed caption for the hearing impaired. So that's that's why we always go on mute. I always go on mute. No, I'm just kidding. But uh, okay, no, uh, Tulio. Guess what? Next week we're going to be speaking with Jose um, from the Radicals. The Radicals, oh, my group. fellow Radical member. Yeah, oh. Jose Leal from the co-founder of the Radical Movement. That's going to be on Wednesday, right here on Dojo Live. And uh, for Tuesday, um, I don't have the full info. I do know that we're going to be <clears throat> uh, having a conversation with an organization called Remote Workers. And But I don't have the title yet. We're going to be speaking with Laurel Ferrer. That's uh, from Distributed. Distributed Consulting, that's the name of the company, about remote remote work. So that should be interesting and relevant for obvious reasons. So that's for mm -hmm. next week, Tuesday, 1 p.m., Wednesday, 1 p.m., Laurel Farrell from Distributed 
Consulting and Jose Leal from Radicals. That's what we have, Tulio. Thanks for joining us, everyone. Just stay with us as we go off the air. Have a good one. Thank you, guys. Thank you.